Asynchronous programming is often a concept that a lot of beginners struggle with. But if you want to level up as a developer, then it's pertinent for you to understand this because this is going to give you the foundation in order to build amazing applications. Asynchronous programming is essential if you want to build real world applications that do real world things, such as interacting with files on a system or making network requests. So in today's video, I'm going to be breaking it down for you guys step by step and kind of giving you a guided path through which we're going to learn not only the basics of what asynchronous programming is, how Dart handles it, but also some of the fundamental concepts related to it within the Dart programming language and Flutter, such as futures, await statements, async functions, and a whole bunch more. So the first thing we should do is actually try to understand what asynchronous programming is. I really like this definition that's provided to us by Free Code Camp, where it says that asynchronous programming is a way for a computer to handle multiple tasks simultaneously rather than executing them one after the other. And what asynchronous programming allows a program to do is to continue working on other tasks while waiting for external events such as network requests to occur. So a good example of this would be, let's think about an app that's going to fetch some products from an API and then display them to the user. If we're not going to be using asynchronous programming, then what's basically going to happen is that when we actually go ahead and try to fetch the data from the internet for the products, our application is going to hang up, it's going to freeze. The UI is not going to work anymore because we're waiting for the data to become available. It has essentially blocked the execution of the program. And now once the data is going to be available, then the user can again interact with the application. But I do not want this because this is not a good user experience. So what I can do in this case is use asynchronous programming, where what I'm going to do is tell the program that, hi, I want this data, go fetch this data. And once the data is available, let me know. And in the meantime, you can do other stuff. So this way, the user can still in the app while the data is loading, maybe go to the settings page, do other things like that. And then once the data is available, then if they come back to the actual products page, the products are being displayed to them. And this way, we can ensure that they have a good experience. And similarly, asynchronous programming might be used in scenarios where you are going to be running a long running tasks. When you're uploading a video to YouTube, you don't want the actual YouTube application to freeze up because uploading a video is going to take some time. So what YouTube allows us as creators to do is to actually drag and drop our video in and start uploading the video. But then I can go anywhere within YouTube studio while my actual video is being uploaded. And this is another example of asynchronous programming. But the easiest way you can think of it is that asynchronous programming, as this definition mentions, is a way for a computer program to handle multiple tasks simultaneously rather than executing them one after another. So let's talk about how you kind of work with asynchronous programming in Flutter. The most fundamental thing that comes to your mind is a future. Wherever you're going to see a future, that usually pertains to some kind of an asynchronous programming scenario. So what is a future? Let's talk about that first. So what I like to tell people is that a future in Dart represents a value that is going to be available sometime in the future. And a future basically is a promise you could think of as you're coming from the JavaScript world, is that, hey, this is going to be a value that's going to be available to you in the future. And I will notify you of that. So let's now take a look at ondartpad.dev, which is an excellent website where you can write your Dart code within a web ID and then execute it. A concrete example of what a future is, how we define it, and how we work with it. So what I'm going to be doing is basically creating a function, and this is a mock function, and I'm going to call it fetch data. And what my function is going to do is that it's going to say that, hey, this function is going to return a future. And then obviously the future is basically, you could think of as a wrap around a value. And the future says that, hey, in the future, I'm going to provide you with the value. And what is that value going to be? Well, it could be anything that you want it to be. It's going to be the value that gets returned by whatever operation that you're going to perform. It's going to take some time to complete. So in my case, what I'd like to do is that once my operation completes, I'm going to be returning a string. So then my future is going to be of type string. There we go. And that's pretty much done. And the S here needs to be uppercase. Then I'm going to say that this function is going to be called fetch data, like so. And with this done, the next thing that I'm going to be doing is opening the body up. And then here, I'm going to be defining the actual future. So futures can be defined in a lot of different ways. What I'm going to be doing is using the future.delayed function, which basically allows me to 
create a future using a duration object. So I'm going to say that I'm going to have a future dot delayed. And then I'm going to say that the duration is going to be, let's just say seconds two. There we go. And that's pretty much all we had to do. And with this done, let's do this. Let's remove the actual type for the future now. And let's just say that we are just going to return a future. And that's pretty much all we're going to be doing. So basically this fetch data function is going to return a future and this future is going to take two seconds to complete. If this was a network request, it might take a certain amount of time to complete. And then what I can do is come within my main function and actually call fetch data. And since this returns a future, if I want to get notified when this future completes, what I can do is actually chain on a then clause. And what this basically says is that, hey, when this future completes, which fetch data is going to return us a future, I want you to run this function. And then within this then statement, I can define an anonymous function like so. And this function is going to be run once the future completes. And this function is going to get as an argument passed to it, the actual value that gets resolved when the future completes. So in this case, I'll call it we like so. And with this done, what I can do is say print and I can do future completed. There we go. And then I'm going to basically copy the statement, paste it at the top and say future started and then do run. And you're going to see that the application runs, and then after two seconds, it says future completed. So this is basically an essence of how you work with asynchronous programming within Flutter. And now you're going to see, hey, Hussein, how can I run parallel tasks using this? Well, if I go ahead and I do future started, and then I'm going to do another print statement, which is moving ahead, you're going to see that firstly, future started is going to get printed, then moving ahead is going to be printed. And then once the future resolves after two seconds, future completed will be printed. So what's basically happening here is that the first line of code is ran. Then it sees that it's a future. So it runs it and then it moves on to the next line, which is print moving ahead. And then once the future completes, it calls this function, which we've defined as an anonymous function in the then clause. And then it basically does whatever it needs to do once the future completes. So as you can see, now we're running parallel tasks at once and our program is not blocking the main thread when we actually call the future. So here I'd like to talk about an important fact in Dart and that is about concurrency and isolates. And as you can see on the official documentation for Flutter, it says that all Dart code runs in isolates. And I don't want to confuse you guys too much, but I'm just showing you guys so that you understand that Dart functions in a bit of a different manner than just traditional asynchronous programming where we have the concept of threads. So basically isolates differ from threads in one simple way and that is that isolates have their own isolated memory. Threads share memory, isolates do not. So the only way isolates can communicate with each other is through messaging. And the way Dart works is that you have this main isolate that you can see and then this main isolate is what's running the actual flow of your application. And what basically happens when we call the main function is that this is executed within the actual main isolate. Then we go ahead and call this function, which returns a future. So then what's happening here is that the actual operation that needs to happen for this future to resolve is pushed to another isolate. And then we move to the next statement within our main isolate. So that's basically how futures work within Flutter. And this is basically all you need to know for now as a beginner. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is then what is an async function and what's an await statement? Why do we use those? Well, the reason we use those are for two things. One is to improve the readability of our code, because you can see here that if you have a bunch of futures, let's just say that I copy and do this, that it becomes very difficult and cumbersome for somebody to understand what's going on. It's a lot of function chaining and function chaining is something that at least I don't like. So what you can do is instead of doing this, use a async function and then an abate statement. I'll show you how to use that. 
And the second benefit of using async await is that it allows us to basically reason about asynchronous operations much better because it makes asynchronous code appear like it's synchronous. So I'll give you an example of this now as well. Let's just say that what I want to do is transform my fetch data function into a function that's going to return to me a string. And it's also going to be a function that's going to be asynchronous. So it's going to take some time to complete. So the first thing that I can do is that I can say that, hey, since this function is going to be performing some kind of an asynchronous operation within it, I'm going to mark it as async. There we go. And then after this is done, the next thing that I'm going to be doing is basically using the await statement. So what the await statement allows me to do now is basically stop the program from moving to the next line of code till this future resolves. So once this future resolves, then we'll move to the next line. So in the next line, what I'm going to be doing is returning a string like I had alluded to before for this function. So I'm going to say that this function is going to return a string. And again, I'm going to say that the string will be future completed. There we go. And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and instead of using a future here, say that now this function returns a string. Well, if I do this, you're going to see that we're going to get an error. So the key knight among you might have already noticed so since this function has been marked as asynchronous, it has to return a future. And then since it's going to be returning a string, the actual value that the future is going to be resolving to is going to be of type string. So the return type here can't be string. It has to be a future. And then what is the specific type of the value that's going to be returned once the future resolves? When in this case, that's going to be string. There we go. And if I do this, then it's not going to give me an error anymore. So now once this done, you can see that I've defined again some asynchronous piece of code. But one, it's easier for me to understand what's going on because uh, there is no more function chaining. And the other thing is that it makes the code much more cleaner and easily understandable. So now what's going to happen is that I can go ahead within my main function and I can say print future started. And then what I can do is say that I'm going to do print. And this time I'm going to do fetch data and you're going to see why I did it this way and then execute the function. And then after that, I'm going to say that we're going to print moving ahead. If I go ahead and do this, you're going to see that instantly we're going to get three statements printed out. The first is going to be future started. Then it's giving me a weird output saying instance of future string. I thought it's going to return a future completed and then moving ahead. So what's basically happening here is that we call the first line of code, we move to the next line of code, so we execute the function, and we don't wait for this actual operation to complete. We're not concerned with the actual return value from this future. I just want to call this function, move it to a separate isolate, and then go on my merry way. And then I go ahead and call moving ahead. But what if I want to actually wait for this actual operation to complete? Well, in that case, I can do the first thing that I'd show you, which is to attach a then clause to this, which was like so. And then just wait for the future to resolve. So it's going to be this anonymous function. And then within this, I can do print we. And that's pretty much all we have to do. And with this, if I go ahead and run it, you're going to see that I'm going to do future started, moving ahead, and then future completed. So the same thing that we were doing before. But if my actual need is that I want for these statements to be executed one after another, even if it's an asynchronous operation, I need for the future to actually resolve before I move to the next line, then what I can do is use the await statement. So for that, what I'm going to do is basically say that I'm going to do await and then I'm going to do fetch data like so. And then this function is going to, as you can see, return a future string. So I need to save this actual return value within a variable. So I will say that I'll create a string variable. And then I'm going to say the name for the variable will be V and set it to await fetch data. And by doing this, what's basically going to happen is that now, instead of us being returned a future of string, await is going to wait for this function to resolve its future. And then once that is done, the actual return value that we get, which is going to be type string, is going to be saved within this variable. But whenever you're going to be using the await keyword within a function, you have to mark this function as async. And that's going to fix the issue here as well. 
So with this now, I can go ahead and add the print V line again. And now you're going to see that it's going to say future started. It's going to wait for this actual future to finish. Then it's going to save the return value, which is going to be string within this variable. And then we're going to print that and then print moving ahead. So if I click run now, you're going to see that we see future started. Now, two seconds for the future to result. Then we see future completed and then we see moving ahead. So this is the part of async and await. And hopefully now it makes sense to you guys how we use it. So the last thing that I'd like to talk about now is that when you're going to be working with asynchronous programming, there is a possibility that you're going to be encountering some kind of an error. For example, the API that you try to reach out isn't available. So you're going to get a 500 error, maybe a 400 error, something like that. So how can you work with errors and how can you handle them without making your application crash in the context of asynchronous programming? So to demonstrate the try catch block, what I'm going to be doing is going ahead and taking these two statements for fetching the data that we're waiting for and then printing the actual value that we get. And I'm going to place them within a try catch block like so. And what a try catch block allows us to do is that if some code that we write within the try block errors out, then efficiently handle that error within the catch block and not crash our application. So when try, I'm going to add the same statements again. And then within the catch, I'm just going to be printing the error. And if I go ahead and run this, you're going to see that nothing's going to happen. Everything is going to work the way it was working before. And the reason for that is because no errors have occurred. But now let's just say that for some reason, and I'm going to simulate an error, that after the future is resolved, I throw an exception. Maybe this is another error that occurs from somewhere else. Um, something like that. And then if I go ahead and click run, you're going to see that it prints future started. And then it says exception. There we go. It prints the error. The catch block is working because during this operation, we had an exception thrown, an error thrown you could think of. And then because of that, the catch block was triggered. And then we gracefully handed that error. And this is how you can work with error handling within the context of asynchronous programming. And then there's also another thing that you can do within the context of a try catch statement, and that is finally. And what finally does is that it basically defines the logic that is going to run finally after either the try catch block has finished its execution successfully, or we added execution, the catch block did whatever it had to do. And after that, finally is going to be called again. So within finally, you can basically do some cleanup logic, irregardless of the fact whether the actual operation was successful or not, or an exception occurred or not. So here, what I can do is just print uh, finally, and that's pretty much it. And then here I can do print error occurred. And then that's pretty much all we had to do. So now if I go ahead and I comment out this actual exception and run it, you're going to see that we get future started, then future completed, then finally, because the future resolves, we print it, the finally block is called, and then moving ahead. And then what I'm going to now do is bring back the execution or the exception again, I should say, and click run. And you're going to see that this time it's going to say future started, then error occurred, and now again, finally is going to be called, so you can do some kind of a cleanup logic and then moving ahead. So with that, that's pretty much it in terms of everything that a beginner needs to know when it comes to asynchronous programming in the context of Dart and Flutter. And the knowledge that I've shared with you in this video is going to pretty much be sufficient enough for you to work with asynchronous programming in 90% of the use cases. There might be scenarios where a bit more complicated concepts might come into play, such as isolates or background tasks, but you don't have to worry yourself about them at this point. Try to master the basics for now, and once you have a good grasp of them, then when the time comes, you'll be able to understand and grasp the other more advanced topics such as isolates easily. So with that, as always, if you enjoyed the video, then please don't forget to leave a like on the video and subscribe to my channel so that you get notified every time I release a new video. And as always, stay happy, stay healthy, keep learning, keep going, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.